Atkinson, you know, um, around, around the teeth, you know, so we spend a lot of time trying to save teeth, uh, from the, you know, from the inner, inner perspective, but there's a lot of things that are going on around it. Uh, and he's been very instrumental, uh, for me over the years with a variety of different things. So <clears throat> to preface this, Mike, where this came from, you know, as a practice, we're always trying to stay up to date with things, trying to make sure that we are um, doing the best for our patients. But it's difficult as the literature comes out each and every year, as the, the various uh, organizations come out with statements, position statements, um, it's very easy to kind of fall by the wayside, you know, let the knowledge fall by the wayside. So what we're hoping to do tonight <clears throat> is kind of just an overview of, of perio maintenance and also the new classification system. Um, those things are related yet unrelated. So what I'd like to do first is just go over the perio classification. So what I'm going to do is share my screen and I have some slides available. <clears throat> and Mike, please chime in wherever you think there's something that a general dentist could benefit from. You know, you see referrals each and every day. So I think you know where the, the likely weak points are and wherever you think we could gain some insight, you know, please chime in. All right. Chad, we good? Yep. All right. Good on my end. Thank you, Dr. Egan. All right. So tonight's Nikade session, Perspectives in Periodontics. Uh, so back in 2017, the American... American Academy of Periodontology had um, come up with a new classification for periodontitis. <clears throat> I believe the previous classification was what, 1999, Mike? Uh, yeah, I think it was around 99 was, was the last rehash of it. Yeah, so I, I would imagine most of us <clears throat> during our dental school educational training uh, received that classification. And one of the things I've realized recently is the classification sometimes take hold and sometimes they don't. You know, just because the AAP came out with it uh, doesn't necessarily mean every periodontist uses this classification. So before we get started, Mike, do, do, you, do you like the new classification? Um, in concept, yeah. And I definitely hear, Hugh, about when you said, like, you know, not everyone uses it. I think part of it's like just when we go to school and what we get used to doing. Um, because remember Sandy Allen, we, we took over Sandy's practice um, in Brunswick, you know, by 10 years ago, maybe 11 years ago. Sure. And, um, and Sandy's a, is a great periodontist, but you know, he was even up to the day he retired, he was still using the type one, type two, type three classification from like 1989 or something like that. You know, I think you, you get set in doing, you know, what's good for you know, what you get used to. And then, you know, you get busy, you're seeing patients, you're running around. And so you just kind of get in your own, you, you stay in your habits. Sure. Um, but the classification, I think it's good because the old classifications um, didn't have nuance to them to some extent, you know, like in terms of uh, and it, I wish the, the descriptors were a little more clear because it's hard to say, like, if I say stage two grade B, that doesn't jump to your head as far as like, what does that mean? Like, what does that equate to? But I like how they try to like um, parse out. Is this patient at a greater risk of breakdown, a lesser risk? Like, are, are we more or less concerned? You know, where are we at? What are some of the risk factors? How fast are they going? And so that that I appreciate to some extent. And my, a lot of times what I would do in my letters is say, you know, they're, a, you know, a localized moderate, or localized severe case or whatever, but, it, you know, then explain later, I think they're at greater or lesser risk because they're smokers, they're uncontrolled diabetics, they've had a lot of rapid loss or, or they haven't had loss. Maybe they have a lot of radiographic bone loss but they had that 25 years ago, if you look at their x-rays. So they're not real, even though they had p a period of disease and destruction in the past, now they're pretty stable. Even though you still look at the x-rays and you're like, they look horrible, but the classification didn't really, ha didn't really have a place for that. So, right. you know, it's a little more complicated, but I think, you know, again, the presentation could be a little clearer, but I like the intent of it. Sure. Yeah. I think that the latter comment that you made about <clears throat> a reduced periodontium health and a reduced periodontium, in the old classification was still what chronic periodontitis, which yeah. So my my so my, yeah, my faculty we get I would go back and forth kind of tongue in cheek with my faculty at perio because they would you know I would say you know, they would say oh you know once they have periodontitis they always have periodontitis but you know you look at them they got seventy five percent bone loss but pocketing is two to three maybe four millimeters here and there no inflammation like they're stable but you know, how do you classify I, I I always say they reduce periodontia my faculty say well that doesn't exist that's not a real classification so sure I go back and forth on that yeah. yeah. Well, it sounds like they, that was one of the 
aspects that I, I found helpful, you know, was that introduction of that <clears throat> reduced periodontium. So what I did, I took several different uh, classification slides. Oh, nice. Uh, <clears throat> there's lots of different ways of kind of parsing this out, but what I'm hoping to do through this conversation at the end is, is to have something that's very clear, you know, especially for the general dentist. So we're, we're not referring, you know, every single patient with a bleeding pocket to the periodontist. Therefore, we have yep. to know how to classify and diagnose these patients accordingly. <clears throat> so the, the area that we're going to focus, focus on tonight is periodontitis. <clears throat> to the left of this, we see the, the gingival diseases, periodontal health. Um, the periodontal health on a reduced periodontia might live somewhere under here. Uh, to the other side are the more obscure um, conditions that exist or that affect the periodontium. Again, these are all relevant. But we really want to focus on periodontitis. And then of these three categories, the one that we really want to focus on is, is periodontitis, one that we're going to see the most often. So the necrotizing periodontal diseases, uh, I would defer to Mike and his practice when, when we see something like that. Uh, but really, the periodontitis and, and in the it must more be rare. Just to, just to say, I, I, I don't mean to cut you, Nick, but the, the, I mean they're pretty rare to be honest with you nowadays. Sure, you, you just don't see them that much. Yeah, I mean, how often do you, do you see one or two a year, one or two a month, w one or two every couple years, maybe? I mean, okay. it's that infrequent nowadays. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> yeah. And then periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic disease. I'm sure you probably see that a little more regularly. Uh, but is that really? distinguishable from periodontitis, you know, as far as its clinical presentation, its etiology is different, but maybe not the clinical presentation. Yeah. To, to me, again, it's, it's not something you see that often. It's one of those things when you look at you, I'm always more worried about the systemic disease that's causing that, you know, like what's, what, 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 why are they getting, you know, what does that mean for the overall systemic health? Again, it's not, it's not, I think too, too common, but when it shows up and some alarm bells go off in your head, that's when you get worried and start, you know, calling physicians and things like that. But you know, again, not, not too, too common, unless you're talking about diabetes. Right. Um, as, as a course of it. Sure. Which is yeah. obviously very relevant as we, I saw three patients today that had A1Cs above eight and all had mm. active perio going on. Uh, so this is, this is one of the ways to, to kind of summarize the classification uh, from the AAP in 2017, then we have the periimplantitis diseases. I would love to talk about this on a separate call, or, you know, down the road. Um, sure. Look at the CYST protocol. You know, how are we using chlorhexidine and other pharmacotherapies to treat these early conditions? Um, I think it's no secret that we're heading into an era where we're going to see this very often. I'm sure, Mike, you've, you've seen this your whole career being a periodontist, but as a general dentist, we're starting to see more and more of it. And I'll be the first to admit, you know, <clears throat> we see it and it's like, what do we do? You know, so there's a whole conversation that we could have about the peri implant diseases and conditions. Uh, I would encourage everybody on this call to brush up on this arena if you're, if you're not comfortable with what to do, you know, and if that simple something is referring to, to Mike and his team or your periodontal referral team, um, be okay with that, but not knowing what to do and doing nothing is really the, uh, would be the unfortunate circumstance when it comes to the, these conditions. I'm pretty sure everybody knows what the formula for clinical attachment loss is, <clears throat> but I think because of its relevance in the classification system, I thought I'd bring up a, a quick slide. And essentially, clinical attachment loss is the pocket depth plus the gingival recession, you know, compared to uh, <clears throat> when the patient had, you know, a complete uh, periodontal health, you know, probably at an earlier age when that tooth first erupted, the attachment was at or very near the CEJ of the tooth. So knowing how to calculate this, I know our hygienists are very comfortable with this. Doctors, we don't spend a whole lot of time in this world, but we should, we should know how to, to rattle this off because it's a very important part of the classification. Uh, Nick, as a side note, yeah. when, if I see a patient for a recession, you know, you know like most things, there's Peri disease, and then there's peri disease. There's recession, then there's recession. But um, if I see like a significant recession, I'll say, okay, well, you know, uh, and I see the referral will say, will say, you know, oh, yeah, check recession. This, and I say, okay, we've well, got some bone loss going. And the patient says, no, no, I've got some gum loss. And I say, no, no, you've got bone loss. I, I, I kind of say tongue in cheek, but I want to get the point to them that you know you've got bone loss. Like you should not see the root of the tooth. Like if the root's exposed, 
the gingiva has gone away, but the underlying bone has gone away too. It's, it's, it's bone loss just manifesting in a different way. Pocketing and recession are both bone loss just manifesting differently. Uh, you know, not, and not a recession, you know, a lot of recession can be untreated. It's not that big of a deal, but significant recession, it's, you know, it's significant bone loss. Sure. Yeah. And I think an, anyway. an important part of this slide and Mike and I did a presentation together back in, I don't know, what year was that, Mike? 2015? Nice. 17, I think. Yeah, 2017. 17 or 18, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about, you know, kind of these early recess, early recession cases. Do you, do you graft or do you do composite? So we did a, a little tag team event at a Greater Portland Dental Society meeting. But one of the things I went over and I, I called the title of the lecture, Perio and Occlusion. You know, when you see recession, just being cognizant of the fact it's not always perio. You know, there might not be uh, a red complex or orange complex associated with that particular condition. It might be biomechanical rather than biological. Um, topic for another day, but <clears throat> occlusion is important in your world, Mike. Would you agree? Totally agree. To yeah. to it's with, with, with recession especially, totally agree. Yeah. Yep. You know, which brings us to this picture here. And this picture isn't about occlusion, Although I think we can all say that this patient has occlusal disease as much as they have periodontal disease. You know, they're, they're both very important and often very comorbid, meaning they show up at the same time. And I think that's why periodontists have to understand occlusion because the stability of the teeth um, is greatly contingent upon the biomechanical forces. So you can clean up all the schmutz you want uh, if there is occlusal disease superseding that then the, the health outcome might not be there. But I, I put this slide here just to show, you know, this patient has active perio. I don't think anybody on the call would disagree to that. <clears throat> but here we have a relatively healthy periodontium. Uh, clean up the bio burden and let the body do its thing. So I, I see this in my own understanding that when we see this patient come in, you know, we're taught that this is always going to be a perio patient. That is true, but I think what Mike said earlier is, is spot on. Can the patient reach a, a state of stability? Is this patient in a state of stability? And the answer is maybe. Maybe their occlusion isn't dialed in just the way that it should, but they might be health, you know, periodontally healthy. So any comments about this case in particular, Mike, before we start looking at the classification? No, I, th I think you're exactly right. Um... You know, and, and you're right, there's a whole rabbit hole we can go down as far as um, how much structural damage is there in terms of bone loss versus how much inflammation is there. And I think, you know, inflammation can be pretty readily controlled by removing the biofilm, like you said. And that's a pretty straightforward thing that can be done. It's done very well by a lot of a lot of people, which is great. Um, and it's a pretty minimal and, and, and minimally invasive and great way to treat this. Um, when you get severe bone loss or you know, structural changes, angular bone defects, things like that, different story. Sure. Uh, or th other things need to be done to it. But I, I, I totally agree with you that the, you know, at least said, you said this person, pa patient's may be stable. The, bi the, infl the inflammatory component looks great. Um, what's the biomechanical component? And that's why I rely on, you know, you and your expertise or restorative dentist expertise as far as saying, like, I, I know it's not right. I don't know exactly how to fix it. That's where you, you come in. Sure. Uh, but I think that that's, that's the other half of this situation. You can't just do with the one. The other one's got to be looked at too and see if that's stable. Sure. Yeah, this particular picture <clears throat> came out of a series of slides I had years ago on the whole health in on a reduced periodontium. So this is a very compromised periodontium, but the argument might be that this patient is biologically healthy, or at least mm -hmm. much more healthy than they were. So the old class, I put this in here at the beginning of the classification for a reason. This patient would have been classified as a uh, patient with chronic periodontitis according to the previous classification. And it's a very different diagnosis now, you know, so there's a, there's a paradigm shift. And I think this is the kind of patient where they really got it right, you know, because I think this articulates and paints a different picture than chronic periodontitis. Cause you can have a patient with chronic periodontitis that looks like this, that patient gets the same diagnosis, but we know those two patients are, um, they have different prognoses. So the patient with this, the prognosis of this patient, obviously much more guarded than this patient. So <clears throat> this gets confusing. And I think the, you know, we're, we're what, six years into the adoption of this classification into our profession. And it's still scary to all of us, you know, all of us being the people that don't use it each and every day. So 
part of tonight's discussion is to advocate that we all take our a little bit of autonomy in learning this. It's really not that complicated once you get the once you understand what they were trying to do. If you look at all the diagnoses and then you try to make sense of it, it gets very confusing. But there is a method to the madness, and this particular three-step process uh, articulated on this guideline that came off the AAP website does a good job of kind of outlining some steps so that we can clarify the diagnosis. And in a nutshell, <clears throat> you know, the, the first is just acquiring data to help support a diagnosis. Now, again, we're talking about periodontitis here. We're not talking about gingivitis. We're not talking about, you know, some of the more obscure conditions. This is just periodontitis and how to parse out the different diagnoses according to um, the stage and the grade. So as we can see here, step two is establishing the stage. <clears throat> and we may or may not be familiar with the stage and grade terminology that comes from the world of oncology. So oncology had come up with this years ago and what it did, it, it gave the oncologist a much better description of what process was going on, where they were in the hierarchy of the condition, but then also the grade or the future risk associated with that condition. So the, the first one is the stage and we'll, we'll look at a couple different <clears throat> uh, charts to hopefully articulate what this is. But in a nutshell, stage is essentially saying how much bone loss have you had or how much clinical attachment loss have you had or has the patient had up to this point. So if the patient has zero bone loss, they're not a periodontal patient, they don't fall into this category. But if they have bone loss, they're classified as stage one, two, three, or four. And we'll take a look at another slide. I didn't think this one was very helpful, but I thought this one was a little bit better. But before I show you that slide, let's look at this. This is the simplified version of how to get the stage. The stage is the first part of this process. And the stage comes down to where's the bone in relation to the CEJ. So the CEJ is, is up here. Once upon a time, <clears throat> the bone lived at that level under healthy conditions. And then over uh, the course of the disease process, there was degradation. So stage one, periodontitis, is when the bone is less than 15% away from the CEJ. Stage two, the coronal third of the root, so up to 33%. And then, you know, I think this is probably a little off scale because stage four, you know, you're not gonna have <laughs> no bone around a tooth. Uh, so I think these are off scale, but the point is, if the bone loss is in the apical third, so anywhere in this range here, uh, that would be stage four middle third, stage three, so on and so forth. So I like this simple diagram because it simplifies this guy here. I'm a picture person. <clears throat> when I look at a table, although I love tables, it takes me longer to understand what's going on. But again, we're, we're talking about staging. I'm gonna keep coming back to where are we in the hierarchy of the diagnosis. Right now we're in the stage, which again is how much bone loss we've had. So, Periodontitis stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. The ideal way of doing this is based on clinical attachment loss. So one to two millimeters, three to four, greater than five, or sorry, that should be less than, no, oh, they're both greater than five. And Mike, you can, you can help kind of resolve these for me. As we go down the list, there'll be a differentiator between three and four. The point is that stage three and four is severe periodontitis, where stages one and two are mild and moderate. Uh, before I go down the list here, Mike, do you have any, any comments about this in particular? No, I think going down the list will explain a little, little bit more, but I think, I mean, the stage three and four variations kind of subtle, but because they're both five millimeters or above, but basically stage three to me is like, um, there's more advanced bone loss, but it's something that is, I guess, treatable you know we, we, we can manage it stage four is it's going off the rails sure. um it's much more you know um much more of a thorough breakdown of the dentition sure. uh, it, it, with that bone muscle yeah would you ever see patients that are stage four that don't have mobility or at that point are they they're, they're pretty much doomed at that point um so, um like most things sometimes uh it you know, you, you get the patient with very long roots to some extent. Um, and so they're, they're, they may have greater than five millimeters of, you know, pocketing. Uh, and, but they still have, or maybe they have great you know, two thirds of their bones gone, but they still have a fairly significant amount that, that, that last one third is still very significant. So they can still be fairly stable. You might get 
some mobility, but maybe it's relatively mild. Um, I guess it depends, but yeah, I mean, a lot of times there is mobility with that. You're exactly right. But you do see some cases where they're not, you're like, how are these teeth not flopping around like this, but, but they're not. Right. Yeah. So then we go down, you know, we talked about the, um, remaining bone level. I think the RBL is indicating here. Um, you know, again, this, this diagram here articulates what that is to give us some sense. And I don't think this is exactly like we need to get out a ruler every single time. These are generalizations, uh, but they help us to put them into the, the, the different stages. So stage one and two, there's been no tooth loss associated to periodontitis. So there might be tooth loss due to trauma, you know, a periapical abscess that caused uh, the tooth to require endo, so on and so forth. But being able to attribute it only to periodontitis uh, allows us to then further classify. How do we resolve, maybe there are times when this, the, the most amount of interdental clinical attachment loss that we have is three to four millimeters, but they're missing greater than five teeth. Do we go with the greater than five teeth loss to periodontitis, or do we go with the clinical attachment loss? Or does that situation never happen? We're going to have... I, I would say... Yeah, yeah I would say it's a judgment call. Like, you know, what, what, why, why were those teeth lost? You know, was it, you know, if their if their measurements are not that bad necessarily everywhere else, then it's probably maybe you know, if the patient knows caries, fracture, you know, trauma, uh, things like that. And, you, know, you usually it kind of, I, I, when I ask questions to the patient, it kind of sorts itself out, like which one they're in usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. <clears throat> in my reading about this, they they really said just look at the clinical attachment loss, and that's going to give you the the staging. Uh, more often than not, you know, as we go down the list, it's just adding more descriptors for us to use when maybe it's not so clear, cut and dry. Mm -hmm. The complexity part, <clears throat> um, it's just further information for us to, to understand which stage it's in. You know, I like how they, they kind of put horizontal bone loss is more likely to be the, um, the flavor of bone loss in the early stages where you're more likely to have vertical bone loss associated with the deeper stages. Is this a trend that you would agree to here? I, I would. I, I would. Uh, one thing I, I, I always disagree with is that they should say angular defects versus vertical bone loss because all bone loss is vertical in a sense. Uh, mm. It's a it's a semantic thing, but um, but you're right. I think you know you, that, that sort of gradual lowering of bone is more at the early stage. When you start seeing those deep angular defects start shooting, there you know th things are going on. So we're getting more serious, whether it's a localized effect or more generalized. Yeah, I, I'll see a lot of patients with perfect perio, you know, condition, except they've an open, this happens a lot. They're bruxer, you know, and this is where I work with, you know, you and other great sort of dentists. They're a bruxer. They've opened up a contact. It's a food trap. They've got nine millimeters of bone loss with a big angular radiographic defect between 18 and 19 or, you know, 30, 31. But the rest of them, the rest of them are totally fine. You know, it's a very localized type of angular defect. It's getting severe, but everywhere else is okay. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because in their description, they say you select the worst site in the mouth to use for your staging and grading. But that opens the door to the situation that you just said, that there's an, a localized situation that may be um, arrived from an etiology that was separate from a bacterial problem. Uh, so I think that's mm -hmm. where it might be difficult. So if you have a relatively healthy periodontium and you have a nine millimeter pocket somewhere, and you don't see a crack, you don't see a wear facet that's contributing to periodontal breakdown, are you still using that nine millimeter pocket to classify the stage? Because you might end up classifying the patient as a stage four when the rest of their mouth is healthy. But according to the guidance from this, this workshop, they say, mm -hmm. take the worst site. You know, so I, I think, like you said, you have to use some judgment here. Yeah, it's, to me, the last line in this slide is the most important one as far as that goes, because they say, you know, for each stage, uh, describes the localized or generalized. So, you know, I, I might say, or my, my letter to my diagnosis letter might say, patient, you know, is a generalized, is generalized clinically healthy with a localized stage four, you know, grade C or grade B, you know, uh, periodontitis, you know. Gotcha. Sec second, secondary to, you know, open contact from bruxism, and perifunctional habits, and things like rest restorative, uh, film, you know, restoration breakdown, things like that. Okay. That makes sense. May you have a situation where you're where you have generalized maybe stage two and then a localized stage four. Yeah, and that's and that's why I don't know if I necessarily followed this. 
I, you, you're right when you say you pick the worst one and go from there, but I like nuance in that because I think it's more accurate for us as far as our treatment and what we decide to do. So I might say generalize this, but localize that. Because you might have someone who's got, you know, oral hygiene is not great, um, has some generalized minor bone loss, but some really bad areas on their, on their maxillary molars or, so, or maybe a, a bad mesial concavity on for maxillary first premolars. You know, so I want to kind of parse that out. Because I might say, you know, maybe they need some scaling, replanning in some spots, but but I'm going to go right to surgery in that one spot, you know, or they'll, they'll be mostly fine with pretty relatively minor treatment, but I'm not going to waste time doing scaling for this nine millimeter deep angular defect over there. I'm just going to jump right to something else. Right. Do you ever use the the pattern descriptions here? So if the, you know, we've seen patients where it, for whatever reason, it seems like the periodontitis is localized either anteriorly or posteriorly and not the other. Yeah, I, th I think with their, with their riffing off there, doing there, there was a little debate in the peri world about this because that, that and if you, depending when people train, they, they know about this, that's the old localized aggressive. And before that, it was called juvenile periodontitis. Mm -hmm. So that line is the, the latest manifestation of that. Um, there were some old timers in the, in, the, in the academy that made a big deal about this. They were, they were upset that, that wasn't, there was no classification for that. So they put that in there to represent your 30, your 30 year old or 29 year old or 25 year old person um, with overall decent hygiene, overall decent, well, you know, uh, period status, but just massive bone loss in the central incisors and, and first molars. So that, that's what that's for. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. So going back, this is what we just talked about was the stage. So the grade is a separate entity. Again, the stage is essentially how far in the progression of disease are we? This doesn't talk about whether it's active or, or dormant or healthy. Mm -hmm. It just says how, how far along in the clinical attachment loss progression have we gone? So the next step that they added is the grade. You know, grade is essentially, I think when I think of grade, I think of this sign here. You know, it's, it's how, you know, what is the risk of us continuing to go down downhill? You know, I think prognosis maybe, be, maybe has some sort of tie in here. So here's the grading process. Now, fortunately, the grading is a little bit more, I think, intuitive. Um, essentially, slow rate, grade A, as we can see right here, moderate rate, grade B, and rapid rate, grade C. This patient was probably a grade C when he came in. But then they became a grade A. And one of the periodontists that I've seen, seen talk, who is actually a, uh, an instructor for, for Dr. Mike Jaklinski here, um, talks a lot about how he sees his patients. His name is Dr. Dr. Hempton. He's a periodontist down in Massachusetts. And he talks about how patients actually like knowing that they've been upgraded. Their hard work has translated to a better grade, just like we, we got in, you know, fifth grade math. So what I like about the grading process, it gives us the ability to communicate to our patients, good job, you know, and it, it better articulates what is the risk of them continuing. Grade, Going from grade C to grade A doesn't mean you're healed. We all know periodontitis is a condition that sticks around for, for eternity. Uh, but what it does say is their risk for future breakdown has changed. So Mike, you want to talk about grading at all? You know, how relevant is this for, for you and your practice? Oh, yeah, it's pretty huge. And and to me, I, I'm going to um, just throw sort of something I've been thinking about over the last number of years. Um, in addition to sort of the stage and grading that's here, I, I divide perio disease into inflammatory and structural. Th that's a big division I make in my mind. Mm -hmm. Inflammatory is just what it sounds like. It's mostly caused by biofilm. It can be mostly resolved um, through control of the biofilm, whether that's just you know, hi better hygiene on the patient's level, you know, a good cleaning, things like that. Structural are these angular bone defects, these structural changes in, in the jawbone that generally won't get better by themselves. You know, you can't floss away an angular bone defect. You can't floss away an eight millimeter pocket because there's, you know, a large amount of bone loss around the teeth. And to me, that divides a lot more. And, and as a side note, that divides how I do my treatment. I'm much more likely to do non-surgical treatment or encourage the patient to work on their hygiene. Um, in some ways, you know, we're like um, sort of chronic disease, disease managers in that case where, you know, I'm willing to give patients more time to see if they can work on things on their own or see if um, hygiene practices can change or if a little cleaning will make it better. Whereas the other structural issue, I'm much more likely to go right to surgery. And that's much more in a sense, fix, fix you know, and you're exactly right. 
Peri disease, especially where there's the strong genetic component, which is, I think is more applicable to the inflammatory periodontitis, because that genetic component, that's much more, it's, it's there and it's with you right. to some extent. The structural problems, again, it could be occlusal trauma, open contacts, a fractured root, a root groove, mm-hmm. uh, cavity. That's more something that we can, you know, that's more sort of traditional dentistry where we, you know, I can do something to you and I can fix it or someone can fix it by mechanically fixing whatever that problem is. Um, but so, it, so some of your patients will get very upset by saying, you know, I'm brushing like crazy and everything, right? Why is this not getting better? It's like, well, you, you, you know, you've got it, you know, you, you've got an open forcation, you've got a root groove, you've got a structural thing. Like, you know, don't beat yourself up. You can't fix that. But on the flip side, if it's much more, I think they could do a lot better if they just, you know, put a water pick in their mouth or floss or they, they in approximately proxy brushes, they did something. I'm much more apt to encourage them to coach them to make them feel better, you know, the mind games we all do to make people um, do what they can on their own end. You know, I feel like I've got a much more appreciation for primary care doctors or internal medicine doctors that have to deal with all these chronic conditions that could be made better by better, you know, exercise and diet and things like that. Um, and how and how they get their patients to sort of get by and try to do this on their own. But you know, those little games like that, like you know, making patients feel better, absolutely. I think it's great to be like, oh, you know, you're 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 getting better. I think you're kind of getting more stable. Right. Yeah. You you just made a comment that I think would be worthwhile going over, and it has to do with the inflammatory response uh, from patient to patient. So here's how I I like to articulate this in my own head. Patient A and patient B. Patient A has 5,000 units of periodontal bacteria. Patient B has 5,000 units of periodontal bacteria, but one of them has severe perio breakdown and the other has gingivitis. The Mm -hmm. difference between those two patients is the host response, which is the inflammatory response. Can you speak a little bit more and a little bit deeper on what what that means? Yeah, and it's um, and it's one of these things where you know I think we all go through dental school and you know we we do our scaling replaning requirements and some patients get better and we're like all right you know we did it like it's great you know do my job and the other patients come back for the reval and they look they look just as you know there's no change in anything you're like. Do I suck at this? Like, right. <laughs> never, you know, like, you know, was it me? Like, what, you know, what, God, you know, you might like hang up your stuff and go home, but like, forget it. Um, and you're right. And, and that's, that's where perio is both very interesting to me, but also very frustrating too, because um, again, some things we can control and some things we can't. And that's why sometimes I like those mechanical structural problems because there's just things I can fix. You know, it's a physical thing I can go in there. The other thing is genetics. You know, like you said, it's the host response. Um, and maybe someday we can do gene therapy. We'll, we'll give them a pill or an injection to take and you know, we can fix that. But, um, that's where sometimes it takes a little nuance in just looking at the patient, you know, see and seeing like how well are they going to respond to that? You know, how strong is that genetic component to it? That's why to some degree, I love seeing patients with tons of schmutz in their mouth. Like you said, like you said earlier, because we can clean schmutz, you know, we can, right. here's some physical, a thing we can clean off and get better. The patients that, that, I, I uh, not that I hate them, I, you know, they, they scare me because I, there's no good treatment for them. The ones that have great oral hygiene, you know, perfect, you know, no plaque, they're great. And they've lost 80% of the bone. Mm-hmm. You know, what do you do? You know, there's nothing to clean. Right. These, these are the ones I manage medically. And I've got, I've got a handful of patients like that um, where I try to short circuit that inflammatory response, mostly by using 20 milligrams doxycycline, you know, the old periostat. Sure. submicrobial de- uh, dosing. I've had some patients on that for years now. Right. To me, that's in some ways, it's the only thing that, and it, as a dentist, it's weird to write a prescription for someone for six months of a drug. How, many, how often do we do that? Here's six months of a drug and call me and I'll write you in six months again. Sure. That, that's not in our wheelhouse usually, but um, I'm, I'm grasping at straws to keep these teeth in, in someone's head. Right. So yeah, it, I, it's, it's the pain of my existence. Yeah. <laughs> Post response. The host response is everything, you know, I say everything, it's, it's an important part. And I think knowing that as we go to battle against this condition specifically, understanding the host response is, is really key. <clears throat> the grading talks about, I think this is probably the most confusing part about grading, is really getting this, this number here. So it's a, it's a number greater than one or less than one that gives you the, the category. So 0.25, what is that 0.25? It's the percent bone loss over their age. And I think this might scare the everyday clinician, the everyday hygienist, because they're gonna have to break out a calculator. 
Not really. I, I think at, after you look at a couple of these cases, you'll get a sense just by looking at it to understand what the grade is. But you can't figure out the grade unless you have historical perspective. Uh, so here, uh, they talk about the radiographic bone loss or clinical attachment loss. No loss over five years would be grade A. That's quote unquote stable or relatively stable. Greater than two millimeters over five years. Um, you know, just like in the in the staging, these two are somewhat similar, but probably have additional modifiers that give them uh, separation. But really, the separation is the rate, and it's it's how quickly the patient is losing the bone. So, again, part of we're not going to understand how to use this classification after an hour. <laughs> you have to go in and do some of your own research, read this at your own pace. There is a very large library of very different diagrams that I bet might speak to each of our brains. So I, I put a bunch in here, you know, go on Google, just type in <clears throat> periodontal, periodontal classification, and the odds are you'll find something that, that makes sense. The good and news, Nick, if I could jump in real quick, I'm sorry. Sure. If you go back, go back one slide real quick. This one here? Uh, no, go, uh, uh, me go, down, go up or down one. There you go. Yep. So for me, I, I agree with everything you said with that. On my day-to-day -day basis, to me, the thing that makes that I really look at the most in grading is right in the middle where it says, are the biofilm deposits, com you know, consistent with the amount of dis destruction? Like, you know, is the amount of you know, plaque and calculus what you would expect with how much bone loss they have, or is it less or is it more? You know, I, and th that's what makes, for me, that's my quick down and dirty, you know, determinant of the grading. You know, are, do they have massive bone loss and perfect oral hygiene? Do they have... Um, uh, you know, massive calculus and plaque, but almost no bone loss, just a lot of gingival inflammation, but no, you know, no real bone loss going on. Or are they kind of, you know, what you would expect? You know, and there's obviously, you know, shades in there, but that that's my go-to usually is that middle kind of line right there. I like that. Yeah. <clears throat> so you're looking at a bell curve of responses to a, the amount of biofilm that you see. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. What I'd like to do is play the video that the AAP has done. I think they did a very good job of putting this together, and hopefully this starts to put the pieces of the puzzle together. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the American Academy of Periodontology, almost half of American adults have some form of periodontology. Chad, can we hear that? Nope. I'm going to get like we're hearing, hearing it through, through your, your computer. computer. All right, let's try this again. According, According to, to the Centers, Centers for, for Disease, Disease Control, Control and, Prevention and Prevention and the American Academy of Periodontology, periodontology almost half of American adults, adults have some form of periodontitis. periodontitis. A, A new, new evidence-based evidence classification. Good to go. Chad, you got to help me with this. Someday. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the American Academy of Periodontology, almost half of American adults have some form of periodontitis. A new evidence-based classification system for periodontal diseases was introduced in 2018, following a consensus conference of global leaders in periodontology. This new disease classification framework introduces a multi-dimensional staging and grading system for periodontitis, similar to what is used in medicine. This system considers severity, treatment complexity, tooth loss due to periodontitis, rate of disease progression, and risk factors. It also highlights the individualized and complex nature of the disease in each patient and his or her expected response to treatment. There are three steps to staging and grading a patient. Step one, assess the level of disease. The clinical examination still utilizes full mouth probing deaths and clinical attachment loss, full mouth radiographs, and missing teeth due to periodontitis. Although clinical attachment loss is the most relevant clinical parameter in measuring the severity of periodontitis, Radiographic evidence of bone loss in combination with probing depths may be used if clinical attachment loss is unavailable. Step 2. Establish the stage. The stage is assigned based on the severity and complexity of the disease at the most affected site. A single stage is assigned to a patient. 
Stages 1 and 2 signify mild to moderate periodontitis in patients who have not lost any teeth due to the disease, whereas stages 3 and 4 indicate severe periodontitis. The initial question is, is it either stage 1 or 2, or is it stage 3 or 4? An assessment of the patient's periodontal chart and radiograph should be used to distinguish between these two groups. Stage 1 is incipient periodontitis, with bone loss within the coronal 15% of the root and probing depths equal to or less than 4 millimeters. Stage 2 represents progression beyond incipient periodontitis and exhibits bone loss within 15 to 33% of the root and probing depths equal to or less than 5 millimeters. If teeth were lost or planned to be removed due to periodontitis, or if deep vertical bony defects or deep furcation involvements are present, the patient has either stage 3 or 4 periodontitis. The distinction between stage 3 and 4 is determined either by the extent of tooth loss due to periodontitis, or by assessing the complexity of the periodontal and overall treatment required. In stage 4 cases, the greater extent of tooth loss requires extensive rehabilitation. Step 3. Establish the grade. Grading indicates the rate of periodontitis progression, the anticipated responsiveness to standard therapy, and potential impact on systemic health. A patient's grade can change in either direction over time. Grade A signifies a slow rate of progression. Grade B signifies a moderate rate, and grade C signifies a rapid rate. You should assume a grade B for patients unless their clinical history or risk profile indicates either a grade A or a grade C rate of progression. A practical approach to assign the grade is to use the ratio of percent of bone loss to patient's age at the most affected site. If the patient's ratio is greater than one, then grade C is assigned. In contrast, if the ratio is less than 0.25, then grade A is assigned. In addition, you should assess grade modifiers such as smoking habits and glycemic control. Disease progression and severity can be influenced by a patient's response to dental biofilm. Moreover, some cases require more intensive control of the dental biofilm and inflammation than others. Ultimately, Remember that staging and grading a patient is not always the result of precise calculations and should not be solely based on a single variable. Always use your clinical judgment and make a holistic assessment to determine the most reasonably accurate classification for your patient. This allows you to utilize a personalized approach to patient care and develop a comprehensive treatment strategy based on the patient's specific needs. So I thought that was a nice overview of a relatively complicated <clears throat> situation. Um, Mike, any any thoughts or comments about that? No, I thought it was a, a good a good little presentation. Yeah, I agree yeah. with you. Good. <clears throat> Again, another flow chart. I love flow charts. They help to categorize <laughs> things based upon how patients present. Uh, but I did want to go over a few patients. I thought it'd be helpful for us to to kind of put this into action. <clears throat> so I. I pulled this off our um, patient profile. Uh, this is somebody that I <clears throat> that I know is being actively treated. Uh, he got referred for more comp comprehensive restorative care. Uh, but in a nutshell, I think we can see this patient has periodontal disease. So, kind of down and dirty. What's our first part of the process now that we you know now that we know the patient has perio? How do we know? Obviously, full mouth periodontal probings is going to give us some insight there. So. Taking a look at the perioprobings here, we see lots of red and numbers over, you know, uh, pocket depths over four. Uh, but taking a look at the radiographs, I think we have a pretty good idea of how much bone loss there is. So, Mike, do you want to kind of, can you see this okay? Can you walk through kind of your thought process on the diagnosis for, for this patient? Oh, there we go. Yep. Okay. Yeah, just, be, I mean, looking at, the patient, you know, I'm looking at maybe a stage, you know, I'm leaning more towards stage two. I have to, I guess, really look at it a little more carefully, but, um, you know, I see some, some bone loss, but nothing, 
too dramatic, you know, a little more on the mandibular incisors, but you know, that's going to happen. Um, I can't say that's an angular defect in the distal of 18, you know, not 18 looks a little weird in the distal root there. Like the bone loss is kind of wrapping around. Right. Yeah. Like the, a little bit. And, you know, again, you see that a lot where third molars, you know, they really screw up, you know, the, the distals of the second molars. Um, but, you know, if I, if I had to just do a quick guess, I'd say you know, maybe stage two, um, you know, grade B sure. uh, on average. Yeah. Yeah. And I like what they said. Most patients are probably going to fall under grade, grade B unless they have yeah. that, that aberrant host response where they don't respond as much as you, you would think, or they respond much more uh, exaggeratingly from, you know, a certain amount of biofilm. You know, we can see this patient has quite a bit of tartar buildup down in the lower interiors, which is probably why we're seeing more bone destruction there. Not an atypical presentation for a perio patient. So yeah, we'll call this a, a stage uh, stage two grade B. Uh, the patient doesn't have any modifiers. He doesn't smoke, no diabetes. You know, so I think it's important that when the patients have those, that we include them in the diagnosis. And I think that's that's what they're saying. When they say modifiers in the diagnosis, you're actually mentioning that the patients have some of these conditions that are very contributory to the disease. Would you agree to that, Mike, that you include either diabetes or smoking in the diagnosis? I mean, you're writing reports. Oh, absolutely. So you're, you're, you're hitting those high points anyways. Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it makes a huge impact on um, their disease progression and, you know, what to expect from it, especially the smoking, you know, and I feel like diabetes you know, can be more easily controlled either through medicate, you know, either the patient's own abilities or medication, but smoking is just rough and it just chews up the bone. And, you know, you, you see much more bone loss in weird places. Like when I start probing someone, I'm seeing bone loss on the direct palates, mm -hmm. like the direct, not in approximate direct palatal of like the maxillary molars, premolars and, and anteriors, especially. I know they were a smoker at some point in their past, you know, they're not smoking right now. Um, and I'm seeing with marijuana too. I don't know if you're, if you're noticing the same thing, but I've seen, I'm seeing a lot of bone loss, both teeth and implants. I've seen a number of implants start failing um, at people that are, you know, daily marijuana smokers. Sure. Any reason why the straight palatal tends to be a place that shows up in these patients versus non-smokers? I think it's just where the cigarette smoke tends to, where maybe it's the heat or the smoke the tends to gather. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. And not so much the mandible. It's always the, ma it's always the maxilla. Yep. Which normally you wouldn't see that bone, that kind of bone loss there and on a normal perio patient at all. Right. All right. Yeah. So again, that was the perio, the perio chart. This patient's well on their way back to, to health. You know, and what I love about patients like this, they, they come in with, you know, they've kind of given up on their teeth. And, you know, I think that's one of the cool things about perio is it's very much a, um, emotional connection with the patients when you can get them to kind of see the results of their hard work and efforts. Yeah, I'll definitely show like at my reeval, bring like the initial charting and like the reeval charting and kind of go over area by area, you know, what's gotten better just to give them a little positive reinforcement. Like, listen, you know, you're doing a great job. This looks better. You know, you know, work on these areas over here and it's, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a close up of that particular area, number 18. Um, you know, it's pretty evident here that there's a significant breakdown. You know, maybe the soft tissue is covering a lot of this root surface, but being able to see the different bone levels is most likely is the, the lingual, where this is more of the buccal bone, definitely some frication involvement. But this looks rather severe compared to the rest of the mouth. Yes, the lower interior was severe. Um, <clears throat> how do you address this? I mean, it, as, a, as a periodontist, you have surgical tools that you're going to go in and potentially use here. Um, yeah, but is there any sort of takeaway lesson that you would learn from this particular localized area for the rest of the mouth? You know, is, is it the patient's just not getting back there or, you know, what does this tell you? No, it, yeah, if, if I, so my, my rule of thumb, if I see an area, um, that's significantly like it, it, he, otherwise this person was not terrible anywhere else. I mean, like, you know, some fours and fives, sure. You know that, you know, we, we can live with that and deal with that. But when I see one area that's really severe, I think much more like what happened to that spot. Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, a lot of times here it's, it's an impact of third molar that probably did it. Gotcha. Um, that was, that was, you know, you know, right. You know, kissing the, the, the distal of that root. And as it came out, the bone just didn't fill back in for the soft tissue started to, to grow into it and invaginate into it. You get the sort of built in pocket that started happening. Sure. Um, so I, I, so, so to me, it's, it's definitely not the, I mean, the patient has other areas like the calculus and the distal of 19, sure that they could worry about, but something like that, I think is beyond the patient's control. Right. Yeah. That would make sense. 
here we have another patient here, uh, stage two moderate periodontitis. You know, essentially there's there's bone loss associated with uh, the lower interiors. Um, but the point is that using peri you know periapical films gives us a lot of insight on on the diagnosis, um, and then understanding kind of that that hierarchy of bone loss around the tooth. You know, here a little bit more advanced. This is the same patient that has stage three associated with their upper teeth. The classification mm -hmm. says only one stage per patient, but I think it's good for us to kind of think in the, you know, think think along the lines of the patient has different areas of focus and attention, you know, because there's obviously different ways of treating different areas of the mouth depending upon what stage they're in. So I, I like what you said earlier that sometimes it's more kind of customized. The diagnosis might be more customized in nature. Yeah. Here we have uh, a patient stage three. They have 50% bone loss, worse in the maxillary anterior, as we can see in this, this image here. Uh, but they're grade C in great part because they've had 50% bone loss, but they're only 39. So without doing the calculation in your head, if you have 50% bone loss in a 15-year-old, that's a lot worse than 50% bone loss in a 100-year-old. So thinking about this in more general terms, not, ha not having to break out the calculator, but saying to yourself, does the bone loss make sense for that age? Is it age appropriate? And then obviously, if you have smoking, it's going to make it worse. This is grade C because it's greater than one. And then here we have a descriptor. It's, it's generalized because it's not localized to one area in the mouth. So here we have stage four. You know, we've all seen these patients. These are the patients that uh, Mike gets the <laughs> luxury of seeing on a regular basis. As general dentists would look at this and say, you know, I, I'd have no idea what to do here. When you see this, Mike, what, what are your thoughts? You know, stage four. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's... Um... I mean, it depends. You know, I really sort of tell patients, you know, we're, we're going to find out what, you know, as to do my exam before I can get in there. I say, you know, we, you know we've got these issues. We're, we're going to figure out which teeth we can keep, which teeth we can't, and then figure out a plan for what, what we do to keep your teeth, first of all, and then how can we rebuild things if we have to afterwards. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I see that 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 bone loss, and obviously it's not great, but I really I, I would really rely on the mobility of the teeth to tell me how hopeless or not hopeless they are. Mm. Um, you know, teeth that have that kind of bone loss but are pretty solid, I feel more confident that they may be keeping them around. I, I, I tell patients, you know, I can't say we're going to keep it for life, but you maybe you, you can still keep teeth around for years, if not decades, you know, with, with a lot of bone loss. And we've all seen it. We've all seen these patients where the bone looks horrible. And we look back and, and if, we, if we're lucky enough to have an FMX or X-ray from 20 years ago, the teeth look horrible 20 years ago too, but right. they still they still have them. You're like, how is this? Ha why do they still have them? You know, it's a combination of good genes, good oral hygiene, good restorative care, good occlusal treatment, you know, occlusal guards, and they, they can do it. Sure. Um, so I, I've just as a general con, general philosophy, I've gotten much more. I, I, I definitely will, work, will recommend or will take out teeth for peri reasons. But I'm much more apt to try to hold on to teeth, if at all possible. I'm much more apt to take out implants. Actually, but that's a whole other conversation we can have later. Like you said, yeah. um, well, I think it goes to show you. This. Yeah, I love that you brought that up because holding on to teeth like this, if you can, is advantageous because putting an implant in this mouth might be a recipe for disaster because we know the bacteria that cause periimplantitis are the same bacteria here. So taking a tooth out in this patient's mouth and expecting to put an implant in is very different than a patient with a healthy periodontium. Uh, so understanding that kind of line of reasoning yeah. is, is probably part of your decision making also. Um, yeah, absolutely. And that's what the patient's expectations are too. You know, so if patients want everything you know, perfect the way it was, you know, aesthetically, everything else, then yeah, maybe you're looking more of a more aggressive reconstruction. But I find a lot of patients are just happy, you know, they just want to keep what they have for the most part, you know, and, you know, as long as you set the expectation up that, you know, I tell patients, I, I put their teeth kind of in three categories. And you know, one category is teeth that are going to be fine, hopefully for the long term, teeth that may need some work now, and they may lose at some point in the future, but maybe can still keep them around for a number of years. And there's some teeth that probably may have to come out in the short term. Um, and we just, I try to set the expectations up as far as that goes. And most people can say, okay, you know, let's do, see what we can do and see what we can keep. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've seen patients of yours that it's just amazing how they, how they've held on to it. <clears throat> well, we only have a few minutes left. Um, this Mike, this was one of your slides from our presentation. I just wanted to put up there. Oh. Th this picture right here was the topic of the presentation Mike and I did together uh, a few years ago. Do you restore this with composite or do you? recommend um, 
or, or do you refer the patient for, for grafting? And I don't want to dive into this. I think this would be fun, Mike, if we resurrected that PowerPoint and did something in the future. Because yeah. as a restorative dentist, <clears throat> this might get kind of scary. It's like, do I send this to the periodontist or do I just do it myself or do I leave it? So I'm going to just kind of put a little teaser out there for us to, you know, continue our learning journey uh, together. So maybe in, you know, two, three, four months, we can circle back and have this conversation. Um, but I just wanted to leave the, <clears throat> the mic open. Does anybody have any questions for Mike? While people are thinking of questions, <clears throat> so I didn't see a picture on your website, so I had to go to Google and I type in your name. And I don't know if everybody knows what you look like, but it's you're one of these three people. Nice. <laughs> uh, you ever done karate? <laughs> Never done karate. Yeah. Never done karate. Um, at, at least you know when I was like seven or eight for, with my friends, and that ended up badly. But um, yeah, I think someone told me. I think I know about the. I know about the middle guy. Did you did you dig a little more into the, about the no, middle guy? These were just the, the first three that popped up, and I I laughed and I said I got to share this. So. Yeah, the middle guy's in jail for life, I think, at this point. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm assuming that's not you. So, well, yeah. Mike, Mike on the left over here, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Periodontal Associates, located in Portland. You guys also have a, a Brunswick office. Uh, really, yep. absolutely stellar place. You guys have always been very, very helpful for any of the patients we've sent over. Uh, very approachable people. Dr. Morse is definitely also one of my favorites. You know, I've worked with you the most, but, you know, Steve has always shown up well. And uh, if you guys want a copy of your CEU for tonight, you can go ahead and email Julie at SoccerRiverDentistry.com and she'll get a copy of that for you. Uh, Mike, if you need CE credits for presenting, we'll happily give you a one-hour CEU presentation certificate. So Awesome. Awesome. All right. Anybody have any thoughts or questions, Les? Last bit here, last call for questions with Mike. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, Thank no you. worries, guys. Good. Thanks. All right, everybody have a good night. Have a good week. Take care. All right, Bye, guys.